Tomorrow is Thanksgiving, and it's, it's during the holidays that some have considered suicide and others have even fallen into depression because they think they have no hope. They don't have any family around them and times are hard. But on today's edition of End of the Age, I want to tell you that you always have a hope and his name is Jesus. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dave Robbins, and I'm with End Time Ministries, and I thank you for joining me on this edition of End of the Age. Now, if you look at the news, and you would think pretty much the sky is about to fall right now, right? Follow the nightly news. I mean, um, President Biden is a globalist seeking to implement socialism in the United States by redistributing our wealth, right? Uh, regulations are increasing, inflation is rising, which means gas prices are up, food prices are up. Uh, we've got an open border, COVID-19 vaccine and mask mandates. The LGBTQ agenda is being pushed in every facet of society. The supply chain issues, rising unemployment. I mean, you name it, I could go on and on. And if that's all you listen to, it would almost put you in a state of depression. And then some people, I know tomorrow's Thanksgiving and um, some people think, well, I, I don't have anybody. The sky's falling. I'm, everything's just, it's utter chaos and I have no hope. And you sometimes you just think, well, you know what? I'm just going to throw in the towel, Right? especially around the holidays. It kind of comes, it kind of increases right there because you think everybody's out having a good time. What about me? But wait a minute. Throw in the towel. Think about that. What, what, what are you talking about? Americans have, I know that this radio program goes out to mostly, we're in radio stations all over America it goes mostly out to Americans, so that's mainly who I'm going to talk to today. But Americans have a million things to be thankful for. Tomorrow, the, the vast majority of Americans will drive a heated or an air-conditioned car, depending on where you're at, while taking, uh, talking on your smartphone on a nice paved road without a fear of Hezbollah or Hamas, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Boko Haram, or any other terrorist proxy attacking you on the way to eat dinner. You'll sit down at a nice dinner in an air-conditioned or a heated home with your family and have a nice, bountiful dinner. Now, I'm saying the big majority of Americans will do that. And you might be saying, well... I won't experience any of this. And, but there's still hope. There's still a million things to be thankful for. I mean, think about it. You could, it we're not trying to um, escape the Taliban in Afghanistan, right? Or digging in a dumpster for your next meal in Venezuela. Or experiencing a famine in Madagascar, uh, living uh, under the thumb of a communist regime in China. If you're living and breathing today, Americans have much to be thankful for. You say, but yeah, inflation, gas prices. Well, I understand all that. But still, a big majority of Americans live like kings compared to the rest of the world. We have much to be thankful for. We are a blessed nation. 
And compared to even kings of years ago, in history, um, Nebuchadnezzar ruled a global empire, but he could never go to a faucet and turn on the water. Think about that. He could never go to a stove and turn it on and cook a pot of uh, beans. So we live really better than the kings, uh, leaders of global empires of yesteryear. And even though times look bleak, really, we've got a lot to be thankful for. But above all else, no matter what your situation, if you're living and breathing, you have a hope in Jesus Christ. There is never a reason to throw in the towel on life. Colossians 1.27, the Bible says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's our hope. Christ in you. 1 Peter 3, 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. It's very important that everybody understand that you always have a hope. You say, well, yeah, but I, I understand society and the, everything going on in the news. I understand all that too. I live in the same world that you do. I read the same news that you do. But as long as you have Jesus Christ and you've got your hand in His hand, you always have a hope. There is never a reason to throw in the towel. So 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died for you to give you a plan of salvation that would allow you to become a born-again Christian. It's the most important topic that we could talk about today on the radio, the day before Thanksgiving. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you are in life, you say, well, but Dave, I've made this big uh, mistake years ago. It's irrelevant to God. God can bring you out of that situation. There is no need for the horrific, horrific act of a suicide and no need to throw in the towel and especially for depression. Let me give you the answer for that. Jesus Christ. Many folks believe because, well, let me, let me just hold for the break here because I want to make sure I get my points across today because it's very important because a lot of people go into a state of depression. I don't have anybody to eat dinner with. I don't know, you know, the thing is, we're going to try to give you a remedy for some of this stuff on the other side of the break. You always, always, always have a hope, and that's in Jesus Christ. Very, very important. Get seven deals of Christmas starting now. Do you remember that feeling you had as a kid during the holidays? You were so excited you couldn't sleep. What experience and gifts would you receive this year? The atmosphere at End Time is nearly the same. We're excited these seven deals are available through the end of 2021. Why are we so thrilled? Because we know these resources transform lives. And that's even more fun than Christmas, especially in these tough times. For the remainder of 2021, you can get deals like an End of the Age Plus subscription for $9.87 per month or just $99 per year, Jerusalem Prophecy College enrollment for $35 per course, or my personal favorite, our brand new package, Irvin's Last Words. This is a five DVD set that includes Irvin's last sermon, conference, TV show, and radio show valued at over $100, but we're going to give it to you free with a donation of any amount. Go to endtime.com slash Christmas to access these exclusive deals through the end of the year. You can also call 800 Endtime. Hi, I'm Judy Baxter. When Irvin and I got married, we didn't realize that our calling would be a prophetic ministry. Since we started End Time Ministries, there have been many times we weren't sure how we would pay the bills, but God has always provided. 
We started with the magazine, then went on radio and TV. And now we have the Jerusalem Prophecy College in Israel and online and end of the age plus. The mission has always been to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ and the end time message. Through the years, my husband would say, we will see revival like never before in the last days. We are living in the end time now. Thank you for walking this journey with us and continuing in prayer. You are a part of the team. Thank you for your generous support. It is necessary for God's purpose. The most important thing is that you are ready when the Lord comes. Our hope is to help prepare you for that day. God bless you and we love you. You know, everyone, we deal with all kinds of people here at End Time Ministries and um, families and just, you know, people that just don't think they don't have a family. And, you know, many folks, because they don't have a family, they go into a, a kind of like a, um, into a depression around a holiday and some different times and However, I want to tell you that there is a giant family out there for you, and it's called the church. End Time Ministries for years has connected people with a true Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church. All we need is a zip code, and I can find you a church. This is the best way that I, Dave Robbins, End Time Ministries, down here in Plano, Texas can help you wherever you're at. And you say, well, how's all this stuff work? Well, the, the, let's talk about Jesus. How does this stuff work? Because the church is the bride of Christ, the, the body uh, the, that um, with many members on the earth. Jesus' method of ruling the world. How do you become part of that? Well, the coming of Jesus was really to be more than just fame and celebration. Um, and, and if we look at what happened around those events 2,000 years ago, let me just give you a little bit of history here and a little bit of Bible. There was a Jewish priest by the name of Simeon. He was shown by God that he would not die until he saw the Messiah. When Mary and Joseph brought the baby Jesus to the temple to present him unto the Lord... Simeon was there and realized who Jesus was, that he was the Messiah. This, the incident's recorded in um, what Luke, 20, Luke chapter 2, verse 34 and 35. The Bible says, And Simeon blessed them. He said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. So not only did Simeon speak of the unprecedented role Jesus was destined to fulfill, but he also gave a special message to Mary. When he said, A sword shall pierce through thine own soul, he prophesied of the day when Mary would stand at the foot of the cross watching her son suffer and die. Not only was Jesus to heal the sick, feed the hungry, teach the multitudes, but most importantly, and this applies to you and me, He came to die in the place of every man and woman that would believe upon Him. You have a hope because of the act of Calvary 2,000 years ago. And I'm going to tie all this in together today because a lot of people really don't know how all this stuff works. You hear, the, you hear the Bible talked about and people try to make a connection, but they're kind of like disengaged. And, you know, if you can't connect the dots, then you kind of think, well, it's not for me, right? It's for everybody. So when it came time for Jesus' ministry to begin, he, w he made his way to the Jordan River uh, where John the Baptist was baptizing. John announced with a loud voice, Hey, behold, the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. John uh, 1, 29. The Jews understood a Passover lamb 
had to be offered each year to protect them from the visitation of the death angel, right? So now John was indicating Jesus would be the lamb who would save us once and for all from our sentence of death. No more sacrifices, right? Because Jesus never sinned, he was able to die in our place, breaking the law of sin and death. By dying for us, he was able to bestow upon each of us the wonderful gift of eternal life. Once a person's born again, you have the promise of eternal life. So how does this work? Well, Romans 6.3 explains, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Remember, we're talking about the act of Calvary. I'm trying to explain to you how the act of Calvary can give you hope today in 2021. So when we're baptized in the name of Jesus, His death pays our sin bill. Our sins are transferred to Him. And His righteousness is transferred to us. We don't owe the bill of sin, which is death, anymore. Because He loved us and we are given the gift of eternal life. And we now understand that Jesus did not come to this earth to become famous, nor did He come to be crowned a king. Now, there will come a time when we will crown Him King of kings and Lord of lords, not the first time He came. Jesus specifically came to die in our place so that we can live. The writer of Hebrews uh, chapter 2, verse 9, explained it like this. He said, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. So he died in our place. He was a, the sinless, spotless lamb that died for us. Jesus did not want us to face the destiny of eternal damnation. So he willingly went to the cross to die in our place. Now, when he was hanging on the cross, think of this. He was thinking of you and he was thinking of me. You say, well, I don't have any friends. No, that's not true. You've always got a friend in Jesus. I don't have any family. Not true. You always have family in Jesus. You always have a hope. And so, if you think about it, the entire Bible is centered around the event, the act of Calvary. Calvary, Jesus Christ came to prepare us for His second coming. So really, it's centered around that event. And then, of course, it does prophesy about the second coming, but without the first coming, we would all be in a big hurt right now. So do you, do you need something to be thankful for this holiday season? Because, I, like I said, I went through all of these news stories, and, I mean, I could get, if I did not have Jesus, I've told people this today, if I didn't have Jesus, I would, it could be easy for me to go into a depressive state because I, I live in the news every day. And if you just follow the news, the, the, the liberal news media, yes, it could seem like the sky is falling. But with Jesus, you have hope. Without Jesus, you, what do you hope in? Your bank account, that could be gone tomorrow. Your health, that could be gone tomorrow. Your, your job, that could be gone tomorrow. What do you hope in? Jesus Christ. Because He's the one that will take you through the tough times. L let me share a story with you um, that you can share with your loved ones. And, and I would think about this tomorrow. What am I thankful for? Yes, we're thankful for family, certainly. I'm thankful for the bountiful feast 
uh, that many of us will have tomorrow. A big majority of Americans will have. Even if you went to McDonald's, you'd be eat, it's better than digging out of a dumpster down in Venezuela, right? I mean, think about that. We live, we've got so much to be thankful for, even if you don't have this gigantic feast tomorrow. If you just run by McDonald's on the way home, you're still doing better than a lot of people around the world. A lot of people hope for a bowl of rice once a day. Or they're hoping to, like I say, dig through a dumpster or, you know, some people won't eat. And so you've, you've always got to hope. You've always got something to be thankful for. Um, so you think about it. Uh, let's jump back 2,000 years ago when Judas agrees to pay to betray Jesus, or he agrees to, to be paid to betray Jesus. The Bible says, um, Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and he said, uh, What are you willing to pay me if I deliver Jesus to you? They counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. You know the story. So from that time, he sought an opportunity to deliver Jesus to them. I mean, what a horrific story. The Messiah comes to die for this individual and he's going to deliver him up for 30 pieces of silver. Well, you come to the, the prayer in the garden. I mean, you, most of you already know the story. Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Hey, sit here while I go and pray over there. He took, him, he took with him uh, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed because he was facing the cross and he knew it. Then he said unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even to death. Stay here with me and watch. And then he went a little farther, fell on his face, and he prayed, said, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He was not talking about the death of the cross. He came to earth to die. He was talking about the cup of sin that he would drink for every human being. Then he came to his disciples and he found them sleeping. And he said, Peter, you know, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation as well. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So a second time he went away and prayed. And he said, oh, my father, this cup, if this cup cannot pass away from me, unless I drink it, your will be done. Then he came and found his disciples asleep again because their eyes were heavy. It was late in the evening and so he just let them sleep and went away. And he prayed a third time and he said the same words. He said, then he came to his disciples and he said unto them, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us get going, and see, my betrayer is at hand. So, then, of course, you have the betrayal. I mean, uh, the Bible says, And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a, with a great multitude, with swords and clubs, that came from the chief priest, elders, and the elders of the people, and now his betrayer, had given them a sign saying, whoever I kiss, he's the one, seize him. So immediately he went up to Jesus and he said, hey, greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said unto him, friend, why have you come? He knew exactly why he had come. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand, drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. Jesus said to him, Hey, put up your sword. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father and He will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the Scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? So, in that hour... 
Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you didn't seize me. But all that was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Jesus was fulfilling prophecy, messianic prophecies, one right after another. Well, then all the disciples, they, for, they forsook him and fled. And those who laid hand, laid hold on Jesus, led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard. And he went in, sat with the servants to see what was going to happen. Well, now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council, they sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death because they couldn't, they couldn't find anything. So even though many of the false witnesses came forward, they couldn't find one thing that they, should, that they could prosecute him for. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and said that I am... Um, I'm able to destroy the temple of God or that, uh, yeah, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and build it back in three days. And the high priest rose up around him and said, do you answer nothing? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. Jesus said basically in their eyes claimed to be God as a man. And the high priest answered and said, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And so Jesus is really on trial for his life, right? But when he was on trial for his life, who do you think he was thinking of? Himself? No. He came to earth to die. He was thinking about you, and he was thinking about me. He came to die in our stead so that we could have a hope of eternal life. No matter what, you've got a hope. Whether it's a global pandemic, threat of war, or floundering economies, end-time events are happening around the world every day. How can you have peace in a world of such great uncertainty? With the End Time Magazine subscription, you can gain a deeper understanding of current events and its prophesied repercussions. End Time Magazine's exclusive content and prophetic insight allows you to understand where we are in the end time. It will give you peace when horrific news and events happen. When you subscribe today to End Time Magazine for 12 months for just $19.99, you can have hope for the future because you will understand what the Bible says about the time we are living in. You'll get access to exclusive articles like the prophesied American-Israeli Alliance, End Time Do's and Don'ts, and Could School Choice Save America? Subscribe for you or a friend right now. Go to endtime.com or call 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-END-TIME. The symbols and prophecies within the book of Revelation have perplexed Christians and unbelievers around the world. In his final work, Revelation, The Unveiling of Jesus Christ Part 2, the late Irvin Baxter unlocks the mystery of the book of Revelation with in-depth analysis and commentary like you've never heard before. These comprehensive study tools, available for $299, will deepen your biblical understanding. Don't miss this special offer. Call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com. If your station only carries the first 30 minutes of End of the Age, go to endtime.com and click the watch button to continue today's broadcast. You can also finish up later by clicking the archive button. So Jesus is on trial for his life. Jesus said to him, well, it is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Well, the high priest tore their clothes and said, well, hey, has he not spoken blasphemy? What further need do we, do we have of witnesses? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy, what do you think? And they answered and said, He's deserving of death. Well, that was the plan all along. They were just looking for something. And then they spat in his face and they beat him. And others struck him with the palms of their hands and said, 
Prophesy to us, Christ. Who is the one who struck you? Peter was outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him and said, Well, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. And Peter denied it before them all, saying, I don't even know what you're talking about. And when he had gone out into the gateway, another girl came to him and said, Hey, wait, 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 wait. This fellow right here also was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, Peter denied an oath. I don't even know the man, he said. A little later, those who stood by came up and said, Peter, surely you also are one of them because your speech betrays you. And the Bible says, then he began to curse and swear, saying, I don't even know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the words of Jesus who had said to him, Peter, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So it smote Peter because he loved the Lord. And he went out into the night and wept bitterly. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people, they plotted against Jesus to put him to death. Because he was taking, their, he had huge crowds following him and they weren't, they weren't looking to these high priests anymore. They were following Jesus and the words that he spoke. And so when they had bound Jesus, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. So now Jesus stands before the governor. And the governor asked him and said, well, hey, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, well, it is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, well, hey, do you not hear how many things these people are testifying against you? But he answered him not one word, and so that the governor was just marveled greatly. He'd normally people be... Uh, arguing as a, you know, for their life. But he just stood there. Now at the feast, of uh, uh, the feast of the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at the time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Well, whom do you want me to release to you? Barabbas, who's this horrible individual in society, or this Jesus, who I can't even really find anything wrong with, who is called Christ. For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. Pilate knew what was going on. And while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife come to him and said, Hey, don't have anything to do with this guy. I, 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 I suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barnabas or Barabbas and destroy Jesus. And the governor answered and said unto them, Which of the two do you want me to release unto you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said unto them, What then shall I do with this Jesus who is called Christ? And they said, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What has he done? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more and they said, Look, let him be crucified. So while Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that uh, this uh, tumult was rising, he took water, washed his hands before the multitude and he said, Look, I'm innocent of the blood of this guy. You guys see to it. And all the people answered and said, well, hey, then his blood be on us and our children. I mean, what a, what a horrific statement and what a damning statement that that was. Well, he released Barabbas to them and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Well, then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And this is horrific. They stripped him, put a scarlet robe on him, and when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and, and gave him a reed in his right hand. 
And, and, you know, they bowed the knee before him and they mocked him. He had never done anything to anybody. And they said, oh yeah, hail the king of the Jews. Ha, <laughs> look at this guy. And then they spat on him and they took the reed and they struck him on the head. And he had the crown of thorns on him. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off of him, put his own clothes back on him and led him away to be crucified. And as they came out of that, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon was his name. And they looked at him and they compelled him to bear Jesus' cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, I've been there many times, what they consider to be a Golgotha, and that is to say the, uh, the place of the skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink, and, but when he had tasted it, he wouldn't drink of it. It was nasty. And then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Jesus was fulfilling every single messianic prophecy given in the Old Testament. And they sat down, and they kept watch over him there. And they, they, because he was in the process of dying now. And they put over his head the accusation that was written against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Well, the two robbers that were crucified with him, one on the right, the other on the left, and those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it back in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down off the cross. Well, of course, likewise, the, the chief priest. They also had to make their way down and they mocked him and with the scribes and the elders and they just laughed at him and pointed at him. Oh, he thought he was somebody. He had these big crowds. Now where's all the big crowds? Look at him now. He can't even pull himself down off a cross. He actually claimed to be the Messiah. Remember the woman at the well? But now look at him. He can't even save himself. He's such a joke. He saved others, raised people from the dead, did all these many mighty miracles, but he can't even save himself. If he is the king of Israel, let him come down off that cross and we'll believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now. If he will, if it will have him, because he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. Well, now, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, and he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He, when he had drank the cup of sin... He felt the God-forsaken feeling of every sinner, every murderer, every adulterer, every pedophile. Some of those who stood there, when they heard that, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. Well, immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. And the rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Well, then behold, of course, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked <clears throat> and the rocks were split and the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints who fell asleep were raised from the dead and came out of their graves after his resurrection and they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus, they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, they feared greatly. And they said, truly this was the Son of God. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, 
they, they, ministering to him, were, they were there looking from afar off. Among, amongst them was Mary Magdalene and also uh, Mary the mother of James and um, Joseph and the mother of Zebedee's sons. And now when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. And he went to Pilate and he asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in clean, a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and he left. Well, Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. And on the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate and said, Hey, sir, we, we, we remember that he was still alive, how that deceiver after the three days, he said that he, after three days I will rise. And they said, Look, we want you to command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, well, hey, he's risen from the dead. So the last deception is going, would be worse then. And Pilate said unto them, you have a guard, go your way, make it secure as you know how. And so they went, and they made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. <clears throat> well, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the mother, uh, the other Mary, came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door, and he sat on it. And his countenance was like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said unto the women, Don't be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified, but he's not here. He's risen, as he said he would do. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. So folks... Because of this act right here, every person on the planet has a hope of eternal life. There's no one without hope. Let End Time Ministries help you to get in contact with a good church and introduce you to Jesus if you don't know him. I've been part of the End Time family from the beginning over 30 years ago when my parents, Irvin and Judy Baxter, began the ministry from the recliner in our living room. My name is Jana Robbins. I have the pleasure of connecting with our incredible partners every day. End Time is a small nonprofit that runs a high traffic website, a daily TV and radio show, the Prophecy College in Jerusalem, and more. Although we have less than 30 team members, we are able to serve tens of millions of people each month. We survive on the goodness of God and donations averaging about $50. If everyone hearing this message gave $22, our financial needs would be met for the year. If you only give to one cause per month, please consider partnering with End Time to help get the message of our soon coming King out to the world. Call us at 1-800-END-TIME to give today or go to endtime.com to become a monthly or one-time partner. You understand now that the Lord was purchasing a plan of salvation for all of us, that we would have the hope of eternal life. And you can have a hope in this life, not just eternal life, but you have the promise that Jesus Christ will always be with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And when you become a part of a good Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church, that can become your family. You're never without family when you're part of a good Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church. End Time Ministries has sent literally tens of thousands of people around the world 
to good Bible-believing, Bible-teaching churches for years now. And we've got people in, um, in prisons that have been saved and just, you name it. We've been everywhere and done just about everything. And the best way you can give somebody hope, because what are you going to hope in? You're going to hope in government? You're going to hope in your bank account, your education? I mean, those are things that can help you through this life, but a hope deep down inside. Where am I going in eternity? Well, how am I living my life? What, where's my hope lie? It's in Jesus Christ. That is true hope, folks. So the story goes on really quickly. um, they, They said, come see the place where the Lord lay, the angels, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. And there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out. And quickly from the tomb, with fear and great joy, and ran to bring his disciples the word. And as they went to tell the disciples, behold, Jesus met them. And he said, rejoice. So they came and and held him by the feet and worshiped him. And Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go and tell my brethren and go to Galilee, so there that they will see me. And now where they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all the things that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers said, Hey, they told them, come and tell them, hey, that the, the disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. I mean, that's a joke. That's almost embarrassing for the soldiers, right? Well... And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. We'll take care of you guys. Don't worry. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews to this day, right? So then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted. And Jesus come spoke to them and said, Hey, you know, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And teach them to observe all the things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So when, when uh, Jesus was on the cross... Guess what? You, everybody listening to me, you were on his mind. He came to die for you and me. You have a hope today. Jesus loves you today. You say, well, hold on a minute, Dave. Stop the presses. You don't know what I've done. That is a lie from the enemy. I've had people say, well, I I can't darken the doors of a church because the roof's going to fall in. I've heard that I don't know how many times. That's a lie from the enemy of your soul. Jesus does not care what you've done in your previous life, throughout your life. um, They brought a woman to Jesus caught in the act of adultery. And they said, hey, threw her down at his feet and said, the law says that we should stone this woman. What do you say? Jesus didn't say a word. He just stoops down, starts writing in the sand. And one by one, her accusers start to peel off. We've thought for years, I I can't prove this scripturally, but we've always speculated that Jesus was writing... What And again, I, can't, I want to make sure this is an opinion, but we've always speculated that Jesus might have been writing some of the sins that they had done because they started to peel off. You know, let him that is without sin cast the first stone. And so he started saying, hey, Jim, 
done this, and John done that, and David did such and such, and they all started peeling off. And when he looks up, they're all gone. And he says to the woman, now again, the law said she should be stoned. But Jesus looked at her, had compassion upon her, and he said, where's your accusers? And she said, I don't have any. And he said, neither do I condemn thee. But he didn't let it go at that. He said, go your way and sin no more. Don't continue on like you were doing. I'm not going to condemn you, but don't go your way, sin no more. So when you come to Jesus, you simply repent. I've, I've known people that have done some horrific things in their life, been members of gangs and did horrible acts of violence. I had a friend that murdered somebody. I, have, I actually have two friends that murdered somebody. But I've got one friend who came to the Lord. I mean, horrific acts in their past. Everything you can imagine just about. And I've dealt with so many people over the years and seen people come to the Lord. And God forgave that individual. They got in a good Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church. Changed their life. I mean, just a whole different person. You say, but yeah, they committed X sin. Irrelevant. Jesus made them whole. And you say, but yeah, Dave, I'm a backslider. I have, I've, I, I knew the Lord. I received the Holy Ghost. I was baptized. I had been born again, but I walked away. And there's no way the Lord would take me back. That is a lie from the enemy of your soul. Don't be caught up in that lie. Say, I don't have any hope. That's not true. You have a hope today. Let me tell you something. Me, Dave Robbins, I was backslidden. Irvin Baxter was my father-in-law. And I backslid. Done horrible things. And guess what? God miraculously brought me back in church. He brought my wife back in church, put our marriage back together, and we have our marriage has never been better. We have a wonderful marriage today. I have the best wife that you can imagine. She's the perfect person for me. God picked the perfect one, but we almost ruined it. But God brought us back in church, gave us our marriage back, gave us a relationship with Him, and now we're walking straight forward, working in the kingdom of God. Don't ever let Satan tell you you do not have, you do not have a hope. That is a lie from the enemy of your soul, folks. No matter what you've done, God will forgive it. The Bible says... He is just to forgive you. It's a promise. <clears throat> but you've got to make a conscious decision. So I told you this huge story today to let you know that all of that was done. The God of heaven came and robed himself in flesh to die for you and me so we could have a hope in this life and eternally that I've got a friend in Jesus. He loves me regardless of what I've done. Now, you become born again, you start living as a Christian. Turn away from your old life. Live a new life. That's what this thing's all about. And you can have a peace in your soul that will change your world. You say, well, what about all this chaos and what about the government? And what about the Biden administration and all these things that are happening in America? I understand all that. I live in the same America that you do. But I've got a peace in my soul that God is giving me that I've got a hope of eternal life and I've got a hope here on this earth. If our hope was only in this life, uh, yes, I would be miserable. But my hope is not in government. My hope is not in finances. My hope is not in um, 
my uh, pedigree. My hope is not in the things that I possess. My hope is in Jesus Christ. He has never failed me and He will never fail you. So you say, I, I, I'm without hope. Uh, we're going into this holiday season, but I don't have any hope. That's a lie from the enemy. You say, but yeah, Dave, you don't know my situation. I've known many, many, many horrible situations. I mean devastating situations that when they turn to the Lord, the Lord would bring them peace that passes all understanding. The Lord could wrap His arms around somebody and comfort them. You say, well, how can you help me today, Dave? Let End Time Ministries find you a church. Not all of you can move down here in Plano and be with us, okay? So let us find you a church that will introduce you to Jesus Christ in your town. Send us your zip code, um, drobbins at endtime.com, dnorvell at endtime.com, myself, Doug Norvell. We've been, I, I mean for years and years, We've been finding people churches all over the world. Say, just in America. Nope. I've got in touch with missionaries all over the world. We've got a huge database that I can tap into to find you a church. There's only been a handful of people over all these years that I could not find them a church. I've, there were some people that a good Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church was well over 100 to 150, maybe 200 miles from where they were located. And that was, that was hard. But that's only been a handful of people in all of the tens of thousands that we've dealt with. So, like I said, the church is your family. At Calvary, Jesus purchased a plan of salvation so you and I could be with Him for eternity. You need something to be thankful for over the holidays? You say, oh, I don't have anything. I'm, this life's treated me bad. Be thankful that God gave you an opportunity to be saved and be, be a partaker of that. You need something to share with your family tomorrow. Well, everything that Jesus did on Calvary applies to you. He told Nicodemus, except a man's born again can enter and see the kingdom of God. Be born again. Get in touch with a good Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church, and we can help you do that. Even over the holidays, email me. I'll reply tomorrow. And I will help you find a church somewhere that because there's always hope. You're never without hope. Don't let the enemy of your soul lie to you. And we can help you. That's what we're all about. God bless. This has been End of the Age, brought to you by the faithful partners of End Time Ministries. If you're not currently a partner with End Time Ministries or if you would like more information, we invite you to call us at 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463 or visit us online at endtime.com. Thank you for watching. If you liked this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel and like our Facebook page.